Disney Epic Mickey offers a variety of things that are completely new to gaming. You're not playing a game that's a linear experience from start to finish. You're playing through a story, and you get to actually affect that story with your actions. Doing a, a mixed genre game like Disney Epic Mickey does provide for a variety of audiences to, to jump into and find their game. It's totally crafted for the player, and I think there is an entire generation of people out there who haven't really had that experience yet, and it's gonna blow their minds. The key to game stories is to, to recognize the place of story in games. It's not about an author telling a story to a reader. It's not about a director conveying information to a passive audience that just interprets what, what they're seeing on the screen. It's about providing situations, problems, that are personally significant to players that they then get to decide how to interact with. With Disney Animation, that was one of the things that was extremely important to Walt Disney was that it's the story that ties everything together. That's the, the journey that the, the audience, the player, goes on, and that's what we tried to tie into. It really runs core and parallel with uh, Warren's philosophy of playstyle matters because you're playing as Mickey Mouse. That's what makes a great game story. It's about this, this dialogue between, well, you know, me in this case and the team and every person who plays. Getting the opportunity to, to visit, you know, the Disney archives and just look at how much information has been stored over these past 80 years is mind-blowing. This is 80 years of history sort of together in one piece for the first time that players can interact with. There's a lot of stuff there. There's enough there for 100 games. The problem wasn't what to put in, the problem was what to put out, because Disney's history is so rich and there are so many characters and places to, to choose from. Uh, the weeding out process was a nightmare. The whole story around Disney Epic Mickey is about remembering these forgotten characters. And not only is Mickey doing that, but the player is doing that as well. And so their role kind of became this unique and interesting part of the story in the game, because as you, the player, go through, you're learning about characters that you may have never seen before in the Disney archives. And now you're remembering them as well as allowing Mickey to remember them. In Oswald's case, we had to remind people what his personality was like, what his abilities were, uh, what made him one of the most popular stars in, in the late 20s. For some of the other guys, you know, it was really, they're kind of foils for Mickey. They're ways to remind Mickey that even he's forgotten his old friends. We've got a character who himself has forgotten characters like Clarabelle Cow and Horace Horse Collar and the Mad Doctor and uh, Gus the Gremlin. Those are characters that, that, in some cases, he interacted with a bunch in his early cartoons, and so we get to have him play the role of the, the player so we can show kind of the sadness of the, the characters who have been forgotten by Mickey and, and by the player and use them to evoke some emotions in the, the player that uh, I think will enrich the experience. Disney Epic Mickey is, in a really strange sense, a history lesson. I hope nobody perceives it that way. I don't want people put off by that. But at the end of the day, players are gonna learn something about Disney's creative past. Disney fans, in particular, I think are gonna have a great time playing the, the where did that come from game. Because almost everything in the game is inspired by something real. I was in when they said, you want to make a Mickey Mouse game. But when they told me they'd gotten Oswald back, I, I, I lost it. I mean, I was done. I'm an old animation buff. I mean, I knew about Oswald before they mentioned him to me, which is kind of rare. And when they said, you're going to have the opportunity to present Oswald on screen in a new Disney story for the first time since 1928, I, I mean, what an honor. Well, Oswald the, the Lucky Rabbit was Walt Disney's first cartoon star, and he, he predates Mickey, of course. Those cartoons that Walt Nub made were, they were little gems of storytelling. They weren't just a string of gags. You know, very quickly, the Oswald cartoons became among the most popular silent cartoons of the late 20s. Oswald was a big star. 
There are all sorts of stories about how Mickey was created, but he was created only because the rights to Oswald had been lost. That's the tragedy of Oswald. Uh, he, he really was poised to be the most successful and popular cartoon star in the world. Uh, but uh, Mickey came along, and uh, the rest is history. Oswald came back into the Disney fold in 2006, not to star in Disney Epic Mickey, but rather to serve as a catalyst for the game, because really he was the first forgotten character in Disney history. We ran with that idea, not only playing with uh, his kind of sibling rivalry, the forgotten brother, but we also used him as a path for redemption for Mickey in his own arc finding out that he had family that he had forgotten or didn't even know about, but then also trying to find his way through crafting this relationship once again with this person that he didn't even know was family. I love Oswald, and I want to make him a hero, too. That's, you know, kind of goal 1.5 for this project. I remind people how incredible a character Oswald is and set him up for, for success as a cartoon star, as a plush toy, you know, you name it. I want Oswald everywhere because he deserves it. Mickey in stillness is obviously Mickey. I mean, any combination of three circles is identified as Mickey by almost everyone on the planet. But Mickey in motion is what makes Mickey. The way Mickey moves is critical. The animators, early in the project, recreated moments from real Mickey cartoons. Each one of us took a scene and reproduced it in 3D from what we saw in 2D, trying to figure out what was the appeal that drew us to Mickey in the first place. We did extensive research just to make sure that the animators had the spot-on feel of not only the personality of those characters, but also what the Disney animators had brought to those characters to begin with. We actually composited uh, our Mickey into real Mickey cartoons, and people couldn't tell. That's when I knew we had nailed it. And it wasn't that we were literally going to imitate specific animations, but once the animators could imitate them, I knew they'd embodied the character. And for an animator, that's critical. When we go back and we talk about remembering these characters, we wanted them to be remembered in the light that they were originally introduced. The animators on this team did a great job in bringing that to the game and to the player. I look at the game and I just think we've captured the essence of Disney animation in a game. Yeah. We have about five different art styles in the game. There is that inspired by feature films, classical, beautiful look. There is the short subject look in the 2D platforming sections. But we also have CGI, intro and end game, really, you know, computer rendered graphics. A lot of our storytelling moments are told in a style that, that looks like uh, storyboards or concept art brought to life. There are all these different styles coming together, but in a game that's supposed to be a mashup of 80 years of Disney history, why shouldn't the art style be a mashup too? It took us a little bit to get our head wrapped around, you know, how we wanted to mash up some of these inspirations, you know, the, the Haunted Mansion from every different park, as well as, you know, the Lonesome Ghost cartoons. How do those fit together? Different animators from different periods animated differently. So we had an interesting challenge of how to merge all the different styles together. You know, stylistically, you can, you can figure that out, but from a game design standpoint, the characters that you're gonna use and the mechanics and the gags from the old films and the rides, and, and how do you put these together in an interesting way that's going to keep the player pushing through to explore all of the little nooks and crannies to find out where those inspirations lie. I'm hoping people will accept that, because most games go for a consistent, you know, style start to finish, and I very specifically didn't want to do that. I wanted to be inspired by a variety of Disney styles, because we had a variety of Disney styles to draw from. If Walt Disney was going to bring into existence a world for forgotten and rejected characters, what form would it take? It's going to be his fondest dream, which is to build this park where adults and kids can experience joy together and where his characters, his creations, can live forever. So this was essentially taking that same aspect of the cartoon characters who are forgotten or rejected and applying it 
to Disneyland. So rides that are rejected, animatronics that are rejected, shops that are rejected, pretty much anything that was in Disneyland or was even considered for Disneyland ended up becoming part of Wasteland. There were a variety of things that we drew direct inspiration from. The first one actually was uh, a location called Mean Street. I knew that I needed an instantly recognizable place. And so Main Street USA, that iconic image that we all have burned in our brains from early childhood, that image had to be in the game and it had to be slightly warped. It really kind of falls into this world of Wasteland being something that people can identify with and feel very familiar and comfortable, but at the same time, it doesn't quite match up to uh, reality. And of course, that's as intended. Fans of Disney are gonna, gonna be excited because they're gonna get to play a game within a game. It's a huge game for one, but every level, every object in the game world, every character has a source of Disney inspiration behind it. We've embedded so many of these things in there that we're expecting Disney fans to go in and point out the things that are similar to the park and to the archive characters. Even if they're fans of modern Disney, they will recognize, like, oh, those are the hallmarks that everything else has been built on. This is where it came from. You could do nothing but explore in this game and discover things that you might remember, you might want to look up, but they're all grounded in the history of Disney, which is fantastic uh -huh. and great thing to be a part of.